came from very Hi. far away. How many hours did you drive from Ohio? Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Has anyone come from farther than an hour? Two hours. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Okay, so you win. So I brought a distance prize. The longest. But not to worry for those of you who drove only slightly insane. Um, good luck driving back a bit. It's Sam and Grace. They're walking through the woods. It's now yours. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Um, I didn't bring you anything. And also because oh, I, 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 I have sense for you, actually. Actually, so it's going down. But the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm moving in two weeks, and this was in my office. So unless you think I'm always a generous driver. Okay, people who. Drove five, six hours. Who drove six? You have your lovely choice between the things that you have always been waiting for a Latvian linger or a Slovenian, forever. It might be Slovakian, but I think it's Slovenian. That's Slovenian. How do you know that it's Slovenian? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm weird. Let's go with that. She was Slovenian. I think she should read from the Slovenians. <laughs> Four hours away. Oh, no, 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 no. Ish, ish. Oh, no. It is. I know. Fulfilling her lifelong dream. Anyone? Or is anyone dying for these? I'm going to leave this back. All right. So I'm going to talk about Scorpio races. How many of you have read Scorpio races? <laughs> Thanks, Budget. Um, <laughs> he hasn't read it. This spares me some of the awkwardness that is describing to people what this book is about. When I first wrote this book and sent it to my publishers, I told everyone that it was kind of like Jurassic Park meets My Little Ponies. <laughs> they discouraged me extremely for continuing to describe it as this. But the problem is it's really difficult to talk about what this book is about. And so instead, it's easier for me to talk about how I started writing this book, which was when I was a tiny little maggot, I used to read this book, The Encyclopedia of Fairies, all the time. And it basically is an encyclopedia from A to Z of all the homicidal fairies in the world who could possibly kill you. And I loved it. I checked it out from the library so many times that when they went to discontinue it, they gave the copy to me instead of sell it because clearly nobody except for me wanted to read it. <laughs> and so there was an entry in it for water horses. And it's a tiny, tiny little entry. I remember the first time I read it when I was small. And basically, the Irish water horses would jump out of the ocean every November, gallop up and down the beach, and if you could catch them, they make a faster, stronger, better horse than any horse you could ever possibly hope to find. But if they catch you, they'll drag you into the water, and later just your lungs and your lips will wash up. I thought this was the best story ever. Um, and so I tried to write about it about three or four times, but the problem is that there were other components to this legend that made it difficult to write about, namely that sometimes, well, my favorite part that I didn't get to use was the fact that their backs would get sticky from the magic, and also there was one story where people would get onto the back of the horse, a child got on the back, and then another child got on the back, and a third child got on the back, never noticing that every single time another child got on the back, the horse's back was getting long. It's like a limousine horse. And so there was that, and then there was also the fact that the horses sometimes turned into young men who had red hair or with seaweed in it, and they would lure young women into the waves because I know everyone loves men with mysterious past smell like fish. <laughs> uh, so I tried to write them a bunch of times, but I could never find a way to fit all of these components into it. I mean, the whole limousine horses, shapeshifting, who could ever fall in love with a shapeshifter? I don't know. So I tried it multiple times, and it wasn't until I hit upon this idea of making it about the setting that it came into place. So I'm going to read a short little section from the book, if I can find it. Uh, my Film producers at Warner Brothers call it the Jurassic Park scene. Okay, I don't think you need to know too much before I read this. It is so dark in here. There we go. That is better. All right, so it's told from the point of view of Puck, who is a reluctant entrant in the races. She's sitting in a barn with her brother, Finn, and her land horse, her regular horse, Dove. And it's after dark and raining, and they're just talking about themselves. And they're talking about how terrible it would be if she doesn't win the races and doesn't get the money. 
and she's just painted a picture of how things will be if they do win the lottery. I don't want Finn to learn how to bear living with no money, though. I want to keep my sweet, innocent brother the way he is, and I want to keep my best friend Doug here beside me, and I don't want to trade the house I grew up in for a tiny flat in a mill job. It won't happen that way, I say. The first way you pull it, that's how it's going to happen. Finn shreds another piece of hay. So does Doug. And just then, there's an odd creep. The lean-to's metal roof is old, so there's plenty to creep there, and it's one wall or on a fence, so where the boards meet the posts of the lean-to, there's yet another chance of creeping. And the fence itself is not the youngest thing on the island, so really, it could creep anywhere there's a joint. But this isn't that sort of creep. It's more like a creep plus a knock. Not quite a knock. Soft on it. A pack. I can't think of how I even heard it, really, once I think about it, until I see Finn looking at me, completely still, and I realize I didn't just hear it. I felt it. Finn and I both turn our heads toward the lean-to wall to the movement. I want to say, maybe it was Puffy. But Doug has stopped chewing and has pricked her ears toward the sound, though of course there's nothing to see. I don't think she pricked them, so cat. Finn and I sit motionless. The drizzle goes on the roof. We're trying not to look at each other because looking would make it harder to hear. There's nothing. Nothing at all. Just the rain on the roof. Doug's still listening, but there's nothing. It was just the lead to settle. The world is quiet. And then, and the unmistakable sounds of slow steps on the other side of the wall. It's not the sound of feet. It's the sound of hooves. We stare at each other. There is a act again, and this time we both know what it is. I feel the experimental push on the other side of the wall, and I bite my lip hard. With a questioning expression, Finn puts a finger on a switch to the electric light. I shake my head furiously. The only thing I can think of that's worse than facing a kapalushka in this drizzly night is to do it without the light. Instead, I burrow down into the hay blanket I made, slowly to keep the pieces from making noise. Doug's ears will follow an invisible signal on the other side of the wall. If I strain my ears, I can hear the sound of a hook and see the ground. Then another. Another exhale of breath. No louder than the rain on the roof. In my head, I trace the steps we have to take to get back to the house. Maybe one of us will get over the gate in time. That's not enough. The night is dark and silent. I strain my ears for another home step. Finn, mostly covered in hay, meets my gaze, his jaws clenched. The mist pisses over the roof. Water drips down off the edge of the metal, one drop, two drops at a time, making a soft, barely audible sound when it lands on the ground. The wind teases the hay. There's nothing from the other side of the wall. Doug jerks to attention. Looking at the side of the lean to him is a long, black face. It is the I wanted the Lavian one. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, those are not the languages I study. No? No. I thought everyone did Slovenian in there. <laughs> Louisiana core curriculum does not require Slovenian study. Um, hi, I'm Corey. Um, yeah, so I don't have gifts for you like Maggie had because I had to fly here <laughs> from Texas. So, okay. I uh, brought those two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that'll work. Um, Maggie and Maggie can't tell I've done several events together. So it's been fun. Our last one's tomorrow. Next week's Oh. Then we're at ALA. We get to give really cool speeches together. That's so true. that'll be fun. Have you written yours yet? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I just, we'll get an email in a couple of weeks that'll probably say, you're supposed to have your print speeches ready. And I'll be like, oh, okay. Okay, but it's only slightly bad for me because I won a Prince of Honor, which means no one wants to hear me. He won the Prince. No. Yeah. Like, well, there. Oh, okay. Well, that means I have to talk for like 30 minutes. That's a lot of talking. So I'm going to shut up and just read this really quick. Um, so yeah, this is my first book. Uh, it's called Where Things Come Back. And I'm going to do kind of like what Maggie did and take a survey. Who has read this book? Oh, nice. You win. Thank 
Yeah, always do. You have more books. Than <laughs> Why does she win? Um, she has more readers. Here. Uh, okay, I'll steal. I'm own. here to steal. I know. Quantity over quality, Corey. So, um, quality over but, um, quantity. Anyway, so um, I got that backwards. I got the idea to write this book. If you don't know what it's about, this is about a teenager in a small town in Arkansas, sort of like the small town that I grew up in in Louisiana. And he just really doesn't like his town, um, pretty much hates it. He's pretty cynical and smart aleck, his name's Cullen Witter. And um, one summer, a bird watcher from way up north comes to town and he thinks he sees a thought to be extinct species of bird, a woodpecker, called the Lazarus bird. And the interesting thing about this is that people from all over the world start flooding this small town of Lily, Arkansas to try to find this bird. And it sort of boosts this town's very low performing economy, right? And so everyone in this town has this new sense of hope and second chances and rebirth because they're getting this new chance at a life for their town, for all the people in it. But of course, the narrator, Cullen, he hates it because he hates his town. He thinks this is more just complete idiotic behavior from everyone in this town like my whole life um, I've been witnessing. So I actually got the idea for this um, from an encyclopedia of fairy, I'm kidding. Um, it's not I actually got the idea from. Um, <laughs> um, I got the idea because this actually something very similar to this happened. If you've ever heard of the ivory billed woodpecker, this actually happened in the middle of nowhere, Arkansas, a little town called Brinkley. In about 2005, I was a college student at Louisiana Tech University, not very far from Arkansas. I was driving home and I was listening to National Public Radio because I was that kind of cool kid in college. And um, so I'm listening to actually a podcast that I had downloaded specifically from NPR.com, or .org, sorry. And um, so I'm listening to this podcast, and it's all about this town where this bird might have come back to life after 60 years of being claimed extinct. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. Then they start show, um, they start playing all these interview clips from all these townspeople, and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, people are buying food at our restaurants and our grocery stores. They're staying in our hotels. They're buying gas at our gas stations. We have a chance to like be a town again, where you can actually live here and make money and survive. I was like, wow, that is kind of like what would happen if a bird got sighted in my hometown. And, I, and for years, I wanted to write a book about what it was like to grow up in in the sort of community that I didn't really like, like that. So I started the story. What eventually happened is I thought, while everyone is looking for one thing in this town and it's giving them this hope, whether it be a false sense of hope or a true one, why don't I give the main character something to actually look for that means something? And so in the story, he has a younger brother named Gabriel who's 15, and Gabriel goes missing while all of this is happening in this town. He completely disappears. Just out of nowhere, they have no um, they have no knowledge of what could have happened to him. So the story is really about Cullen and his family and his best friend Lucas trying to find his brother Gabriel during this sort of very strange and very uncomfortable and very sort of wild summer in this small town. Um, there's another storyline that I'll mention very briefly about a kid who goes to Ethiopia to find his faith and ends up possibly losing his faith and sort of what happens a strange chain of events that may or may not connect to the other story. I bet you can guess that it does. Um, so I'm going to read just a small part from chapter 13, and what you need to know is that Cullen and his family, the Witters, they are at this point several weeks into the disappearance of Gabriel, and um, out of desperation, the father has hired a psychic to lead them in some direction and give them some clue. And um, the only name that you need to know that I haven't mentioned is Nina Prescott, and that is Cullen's best friend, Lucas's girlfriend. Yeah. And um, that's her. And the psychic's name is Valonia Klein. She's named after two very small towns in Arkansas. Like 99% of the characters are also named after towns in Arkansas. There's a fun fact for me. Um, it was really easy. I just printed off a name from MapQuest and drew lines to it. Like, oh, this is so easy. Not that easy for the rest of the books. Someone asked me, I have really funny, someone asked me, why didn't you have a Little Rock Robinson? I was like, it's not going to work. You can't name someone Little Rock. I it was funny to me. I think by Virginia. I'm waiting for Quantico Washington. Yeah. Quantico. Quantico is a robot book. Like, I'm going to write a book, and there's going to be a robot named Quantico. Someone's going to do that. The Marine Call, never mind. Staying on Marine Base right now with my friends who are Marines, never mind. All right, so 